And so it is, you know, my honor now to introduce the 18th ambassador to the United States from Israel, Ron Dermer. Now, 18 is an important number for many reasons, but it's especially important because the prior 17 men were all honorable, all important, made significant contributions to Washington on behalf of Israel. But the 18th is, in my view, more significant for another reason. And it's not because his name is Dermer, and it's not because he was born in the US, it's because Ambassador Dermer is the first observant Jew to hold, to, to hold the position since the state was founded. It's quite a telling moment, quite a telling idea that Israel, with all of those wonderful men, this is the first time a ambassador is an observant Jew not just an important Israeli. While Mr. Dermer, the ambassador, may be only 46 years old, his story is a long and distinguished. Born where else? In Miami Beach. With, of which both his father and brother were mayors in their time. So politics is, so to say, a family business. But rather than plunge directly into that world, after earning a degree at the Wharton School, Ambassador Dermer studied philanthropy, politics, and economics at Oxford. He also developed a deep interest in history, and to this day reads voraciously. There's hardly a book I've ever mentioned which he hasn't read. While at Oxford, the ambassador was just 25 years old, helped manage Natan Sharansky's 1996 campaign for the election to the Knesset. He also moved to Israel in that year and in 97 became an Israeli citizen. Seven years later, he and Natan Sharansky co-wrote the best-selling book, The Case for Democracy, The Power of Freedom to Overcome Tyranny and Terror. It was the book that was very influential on George W. Bush in his thinking about how to see and interpret the Middle East and what could be done and what was potentially capable that the United States could achieve. In 2005, the ambassador was appointed economic envoy at the Israeli embassy in Washington. And on returning to Israel, he became an advisor to Benjamin Netanyahu, who was elected prime minister in 2009. To this day, most people consider Ambassador Dermer the Prime Minister's closest strategic advisor. As I think you can see, Ron Dermer is one of those rare people who's gifted both intellectually and politically. He's one of those exceptional politicians, whether in Israel or the United States, who still writes all of his own speeches. He doesn't have a professional speechwriter. As, a, as ambassador for the last four years, I think it is universally agreed that he's conducted himself with great dignity, even under what was at many times very difficult circumstances. But from my talking to many members of Congress, Ambassador Durham has enhanced and grown the support for Israel within the, both the House of Representatives and the Senate. And that is truly a long-lasting contribution. The ambassador represents the very best of Jewish political thought. We're honored to have him join us at this first Jews and Conservatism Conference. And maybe, if I could, impose upon you late in the day, please let us all stand as one and recognize the ambassador.
Uh, well, it certainly wasn't easy for me to make it here today, uh, but I'm glad I did. First, because it gives me an opportunity to thank someone I truly admire, Roger Hurtoff. Those of you who know Roger know uh, that he is no doubt cringing at the prospect of me now praising him, which is precisely what makes him so worthy of praise. When I think of Roger, I think of one of my favorite quotes, a line from the catcher in the rye. The mark of the immature man is that he wants to die nobly for a cause. The mark of the mature man is that he wants to live humbly for a cause. Roger Hertog has spent a remarkable life living humbly for great causes. With no fanfare and with little credit, Roger has quietly marshaled his wisdom, talents, and resources to advance those causes day after day, year after year, decade after decade. Fortunately for the Jewish people and the Jewish state, we're on this humble man's list of great causes. So while I am sure you've already thanked him today, please join me in thanking Roger Hertog once again. The second reason why I am glad to be here is because I support your efforts to renew a conservatism anchored in Jewish values and to open Jewish minds to conservative ideas. That will surely enrich both conservatism and Judaism. But before I explain why this effort is so important, a couple of words of caution, which may have been addressed by earlier speakers, but even so, bear repeating. In recent years, many people have rightly criticized Jewish liberals for increasingly confusing liberalism with Judaism. Jewish conservatives should never allow themselves to be subject to the same criticism, especially when they can easily fall prey to the same illusion. First, because Judaism is a faith, not an ideology. Like many ideologies, Judaism promises its adherents the best path to a certain way of life. But that way of life is not what the Greek philosophers might have called the good life nor what America's founders might have called a life of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The life Judaism promises is a holy life, a life that brings one closer to God. It is true that the tenacity which so many of our ancestors clung to our faith against impossible odds and in the face of unimaginable suffering suggests that Judaism has also provided many with a meaningful life. But the promise and purpose of Judaism is to enable a holy life, which is a different life than any political ideology could promise, let alone deliver. A second word of caution is that it is exceedingly easy to cherry pick a few things from Judaism and mobilize them to the cause of this or that political project. This is especially true if the target audience has limited knowledge of Judaism and neither the time nor inclination to go and learn it, as Hillel said in the always conveniently ignored second part of his famous one-legged answer. This easy cherry picking is true for both the left and the right. The winning recipe for the left is well known. Simply pluck out a few sentences from the Tanakh about obligations to care for the poor, widows, and orphans, add a line about the importance of embracing the stranger, sprinkle in a few verses about plowshares and peace, mix it all into a tikkun olam bowl, <laughs> then pop it into a preheated Yom Kippur sermon, and 20 minutes later, voila, out comes a sumptuous liberal cake. And if those sitting in the pews have trouble distinguishing between rights and duties and between individual, communal, and governmental responsibilities, the cake will taste all the sweeter. On the other hand, the recipe for the right is no less available for even an amateur gourmet. Just take the biblical passage 
Yetzer lev adam ra minorav. The inclination of man is evil from its youth. Throw in Solomon's lament in Ecclesiastes that there's nothing new under the sun. And top it off with Rambam's belief that the highest form of charity is providing a job. And you have the ingredients to make an endless array of conservative dishes. Believe it or not, it's even possible to cherry pick a Trumpism out of Judaism. And given that we have the copyright on the line Chadesh Menu Kekedem, renew our days as in the days of old, I think President Trump owes the Jewish people a tweet of appreciation <laughs> for, for his winning campaign slogan, if not royalties from hat sales. Perhaps a personal story might also help explain my point. About 15 years ago, I was at a crowded dinner at someone's home in Jerusalem, waiting in a buffet line behind a very eminent Israeli who was and still remains deeply involved in both Israel's political and academic life. While piling some pasta and a few salads on his plate, he casually said to the person in front of him that after a few weeks of careful deliberation, he thought the time had finally come to create a new code of ethics for the Jewish people. Overhearing this pearl of wisdom, I just couldn't help myself. So I tapped him on the shoulder. That's an interesting idea, I said. But I thought the Jewish people already had a pretty good code of ethics that had served us well for a few thousand years. Ladies and gentlemen, my point is that politics can certainly be inspired by faith and reflect its values. But politics can and should never replace faith. History shows that that is especially true of Judaism. Beyond an ancient promise, the survival of Judaism has always depended not only on embracing Jewish values, but also embracing both a Jewish way of life rooted in its laws and a Jewish culture of learning, which are the only means of preserving those values over time. For without Jewish learning and Jewish living that brings Judaism alive generation after generation, the treasure trove of our faith will hold nothing more than brittle pages, and the wellspring of our nation's values will quickly run dry. So as you move forward in this worthy endeavor, always remember that just as liberalism is not Judaism, Conservatism is not Judaism. Only Judaism is Judaism. Now, all that said, if your focus as Jewish conservatives is less on what Judaism is and more on how Judaism can thrive, then I think all of you can make an enormous contribution, perhaps an indispensable contribution to that goal. And if your focus is not on developing a new Judaism, but rather on developing and advancing a political vision that better reflects Jewish values, then I think you can succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I came here today to speak about something that I think will be critical to that success, sustaining and nurturing the idea that America and Israel are two chosen nations. That idea is so critical because it goes to the heart of the unique alliance between America and Israel, an alliance that rests on three pillars, shared interests, shared values, and a shared sense of destiny. The first pillar, the pillar that has most dramatically altered the trajectory of Israel's relations with America, has been our shared interests. Most people know that President Truman took all of 11 minutes to make the United States the first country to recognize Israel after David Ben-Gurion declared Israel's independence nearly 70 years ago. Some think this recognition was the beginning of the strategic alliance between our two countries. It wasn't. Truman's decision was a historic act of moral clarity. But at that time, America was also imposing an arms embargo on a fledgling Jewish state fighting for its life against five invading Arab armies. 
Israel fought our war of independence with Czech rifles and used French fighter planes during the Six Day War. Not because the Czechs make better rifles or the French make better planes, but because America would sell us neither. The truth is that the strategic alliance between our two countries was forged only after Israel proved its mettle on the battlefield. It was forged as American policymakers increasingly understood that supporting Israel served fundamental American interests, and as they increasingly appreciated that Israel was not merely a moral cause, but also a strategic asset. The perception of Israel as a strategic asset grew stronger in the last two decades of the Cold War, and it has grown stronger since 9-11 with the rise of militant Islam as a force in the region and the world. One of the reasons I have such great faith in the future of the U.S.-Israel alliance is because our shared interests are powerfully pulling our two countries closer together which will make Israel an even more important strategic asset to the United States in the decades ahead. The first reason is security. For the foreseeable future, many of the most dangerous security challenges facing the United States will continue to emanate from the Middle East. And in that very dangerous region, Israel's importance to America as a reliable ally that is a formidable military power with a world-class intelligence service will become more critical, not less critical, for protecting America's security interests. In fact, the fewer American troops there are on the ground in the Middle East, and the fewer troops you want on the ground in the Middle East, the more important it becomes to have a reliable Israeli ally that can both defend itself and project power in the region. The second reason is technology. The 21st century, is a century of innovation. There are two great centers of innovation in the world. One is in Silicon Valley. The second is in Israel. Israel is already a global technological power in many fields, from agriculture to water to cyber. Here's uh, one remarkable statistic. In the last couple of years, Israel has attracted 20% of global investment in cyber technology. Cybersecurity. Think about that. Israel is just one tenth of one percent of the world's population, and we are attracting 20 percent of global investment. That means Israel is punching 200 times above its weight. So in cyber, don't think of Israel as a country eight and a half million strong, the size of New Jersey. In cyber, Israel is bigger than a China. In the coming years, I believe you will see Israel's technological power make it a global leader in a number of other fields, from autonomous vehicles to natural gas technologies to healthcare. But for those two reasons alone, security and technology, I sincerely believe Israel will be the most important ally of the United States in the 21st century. There will surely be policy disagreements between our two governments even serious ones, but when it comes to the first pillar of the U.S.-Israel relationship, shared interests, the future could not look brighter. What about the second pillar, shared values? One would think that these shared values would be obvious to anyone who understands the basic difference between a free society and a fierce society and anyone who appreciate what, what it means to live in a liberal, open, pluralistic democracy. But in recent years, as all of you know, the claim that America and Israel have shared values has come under a withering assault. If I had a dollar for every article that has been penned bemoaning the state of Israel's democracy, warning about threats to Israel's free press, pluralism, and the rule of law, and prognosticating about the rising tide of fascism in Israel, I would be almost as rich as Roger. <laughs> but this is all absolute nonsense. And the fact that most of these articles are penned by the usual Israeli or Jewish suspects makes them no less absurd. 
The full extent of this absurdity became clear to me about five years ago when I worked in the Prime Minister's office and was in a meeting with the Prime Minister and Attorney General. The Attorney General was outraged by a bill proposed earlier that day in the Knesset to force prospective Supreme Court justices to appear before a Knesset committee to discuss their views of the law. The Attorney General called the bill Sakana le Democratia, a danger to democracy. Again, I couldn't help myself. It's such a great danger to democracy, I told him, that the world's greatest democracy enshrined that process into its constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't be prouder of Israel's democracy. Democratic values are tested under fire. That's when upholding those values really counts. And Israel's democracy, while imperfect like all democracies, is not just remarkable by Middle East standards, it's remarkable by any standard because Israel is the most beleaguered democracy on earth. You know, I remember what it was like here in America on September 12, 2001, when there was a sense that another attack was imminent. At that time, people were prepared to trade some liberty for more security, which is perfectly normal. Oh, of course, over time, as the sense of danger receded, the pendulum swung back and people more jealously guarded their civil liberties. That is also normal. Every democracy struggles to find the right balance that reflects the appropriate trade-off at any point in time. That is why before anyone lashes out at Israel's democracy, they should remember that Israel has been in September 12th for 69 years. That is also why as a son of America, knowing what America would do facing the security threats Israel faces, I don't apologize for Israel's democracy. I marvel at Israel's democracy. Perhaps one day in the future, when Israel is at peace with more of its neighbors and some of the bile that is directed against the Jewish state recedes, people will look back and also marvel at how a tiny democracy managed to keep its democratic nerves and uphold its democratic values under the most impossible conditions. If anything, in the, year, the years ahead may actually end up forcing many countries whose governments routinely bash Israel to face the same types of security challenges Israel has faced for decades. And while these countries always hold Israel to a standard they hold no other country, it will be more difficult for them to hold Israel to a standard which they cannot even hold their own country to. Who knows, perhaps the stench of such rank hypocrisy will be even too strong for Western European nostrils. So ladies and gentlemen, as I look at the shared interests and shared values of the US and Israel, I see reasons to be very optimistic about the future of our alliance. But what makes our alliance unique is neither interests nor values. After all, America has shared interests, has shared interests and values with Europe, with Japan, with Australia, with Canada, and with many other countries. What makes our alliance unique is something I believe America only shares with Israel, a shared sense of destiny. You see, both America and Israel are not merely countries, they are also causes. America has long been what Lincoln called the last best hope on earth, a beacon of opportunity for people across the world, carrying the torch of freedom for all humanity and entrusted by history with securing liberty's future. Israel is the hope of the Jewish people, offering opportunity for all its citizens, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, safeguarding freedom in the darkest region on earth and entrusted by history with securing the Jewish future. These causes imbue each country with a deep sense of purpose. And because these purposes are not at odds with each other, but rather complement and reinforce one another, they also imbue the two countries with a deep sense of solidarity. That is why I believe millions of Americans support Israel in a way they support no other country, and why Israelis mourn America's tragedies and rejoice in America's triumphs 
as perhaps no other country does. To truly appreciate the unique alliance between America and Israel, you must appreciate what having such a sense of purpose means to both countries. Those who don't share this sense of purpose or who are too cynical to even believe in a sense of purpose will never truly appreciate the power of the friendship between America and Israel. But this sense of purpose is bigger than any leader or any issue. It is the DNA of both countries and it lies at the bedrock, bedrock of our unique alliance. That is why the real danger to this alliance will not come from disagreements over policy, demographic changes, or numerous other reasons that are routinely cited as potential signs of trouble. The real danger would be for either America or Israel to lose its sense of purpose, for either country to no longer believe in its own exceptionalism. It would come if those who work day in and day out to tear down that sense of exceptionalism in either country succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, you must not let them succeed. And as Jewish conservatives, you are uniquely suited to not let them succeed. As conservatives, you are inherently comfortable with the idea of American exceptionalism and know that it is the glue that holds this disparate nation together. Unlike nation states around the world, you know America is a country founded on a creed. If Americans no longer see that creed as uniquely valuable, then they will not embrace it, let alone cherish it. And if they don't embrace it, then the glue that binds this diverse society together will surely dissolve, and the centrifugal forces of cynicism will surely rip this country apart. If as conservatives you understand American exceptionalism, as Jewish conservatives, you feel it. As much as any group, you appreciate what a force for good America has been both to its own citizens and around the world. The greatness of America to its own citizens can be described in less than a sentence, less than a word, less than a letter. It's the hyphen, the hyphen between Jewish and American that allows you to be both fully Jewish and fully American. Everywhere else, if we were lucky, Jews faced a stark choice over the centuries, either cling to the traditions of our fathers or become a full member of society. Jews could not have both. Jewish Americans who did not have to make that choice can appreciate just how rare and precious that blessing truly is. And Jewish Americans can also appreciate, as few people can, the good America has done beyond its shores. You know what the world was like for the Jews before America was the preeminent power in the world and what it has been like since then. You know the price Nazism and communism exacted from our people and you appreciate what a blessing it was for Jews that America confronted and defeated both. And you appreciate what America has done for the one and only Jewish state. The generous military assistance, critical economic backing, diplomatic shield, and moral support that America has provided Israel decade after decade. Ladies and gentlemen, Jewish Americans are also uniquely placed to help renew American exceptionalism because you can uniquely appreciate the power of exceptionalism. If you are here today, it's because you and probably many other generations of your family before you chose to embrace Jewish exceptionalism. The story of our people began with Abraham's embrace of exceptionalism, and that story has continued only because successive generations continued that embrace. Over the centuries, this embrace was a constant source of tension among our people. In fact, I do not know a single period of Jewish history where that tension didn't exist. There were those who embraced our destiny as a chosen people and those who rejected it. There were those who were prepared to remain a people that dwell alone, 
And there were those who wanted to be a people like all the other nations, or if you will, a normal nation. Next week, we will celebrate a period where this tension was perhaps at its highest. We will light our menorahs, spin our dreidels, and recall the story of the miraculous victory of the Maccabees against the Syrian Greeks. But the story of Hanukkah is not just about that battle. It's also a battle of the Maccabees against the Mityavnim, the Hellenized Jews, a battle between Jews who embrace Jewish exceptionalism and Jews who rejected it. Frankly, I find it hard to believe that the Syrian Greek leadership, sitting in their palaces far away, cared a whit about whether the Jews were circumcising their sons or keeping their traditions. But I have no doubt that the Mityavnim cared. They cared because these Jews saw the Maccabees' embrace of Jewish exceptionalism as a threat to their desire to become like all the other Greeks. So they hoped to mobilize the Syrian Greeks into action. The Maccabees won and Judaism survived. But the tension between exceptionalism and normalcy continued down the ages to the very dawn of modern Zionism. At the end of the 19th century, as the Enlightenment spread, the forces of normalcy were clearly carrying the day, particularly among Jewish intellectuals. In fact, the major dispute between them was not the choice between exceptionalism and normalcy, but rather the surest path to normalcy. Some Jews advocated assimilation. They thought that the way to be like all the other nations in faith was to abandon one's own nation and faith. Some Jews advocated communism. They thought that the way to be like all the other nations in faith was to get rid of all nations and faiths. And then there were the Zionists, who were relatively few in number. They thought that the way to be like all the other nations was for the Jews to have a state like all the other nations. While these Jews all had different pasts, the goal was the same, to make the Jews like all the nations, to make the Jews a normal nation. And where the assimilationists failed and the communists failed, the Zionists succeeded. They built a state, established an army, built a parliament, a Supreme Court, and all the other institutions that other countries possess. They built what looks like a normal country. And the question for Israel today has become a question that has faced Jews across the ages. Does Israel want to be a normal country? Or do we want to be an exceptional country? I believe that Israel's survival, survival, depends on it making the latter choice. I believe that the reason why Zionism succeeded in its project to normalize the condition of the Jewish people is because it hitched that project to exceptional ends. Ends that reconnected an ancient nation to its homeland, revived a dead language, returned a scattered people, and restored a lost sovereignty. I believe that the only normalcy Israel needs is the normalcy of power. And now that we have the normalcy of power, we must ensure that that power always remains wedded to accepts exceptional ends. And that is where all of you come in. A movement of Jewish conservatives that helps strengthen exceptionalism in America can also help strengthen exceptionalism in Israel. And I believe you can succeed in both places because deep inside, Americans and Israelis know that they are exceptional. And your job in the years ahead will not be to pour exceptionalism in, but to draw that exceptionalism out. That is a great and worthy cause, a cause that is worth living humbly for. Because if you succeed, then you will not only help buttress the alliance between our two chosen nations, you will help secure the Jewish future and ensure that America remains the best hope on earth for generations to come. Thank you. Israel is a far more 
in terms of its Jewish content, its Jewish beliefs as a Zionist state and a Jewish ambassador exemplifies that in the very best way. The United States is in quite the reverse position. Rising assimilation, rising intermarriage, failure of many, many different sectarian groups in Jewish faith. And we're sitting here today, and I would just ask you, what can Israel do today to help the American Jews in terms of leadership, in terms of their understanding of values, in terms of their um, seeing that what's required of them in terms of being truly exceptional, not just, as a, not just American exceptionalism, but Jewish. really believing in Jewish exceptionalism. So what can Israel do today? Well, uh, 50 years ago, uh, one of my more illustrious, maybe the most illustrious predecessor, uh, which would be Yitzhak Rabin, Zichron Levachad, or Abba Eben, of course, before him, those were probably the two most illustrious predecessors. He, he used to get asked everywhere he went, um, what is the thing that American Jews can do for Israel? And he would always give him the same answer. He said, strengthen Jewish identity here in America. And 50 years later, I could give the same answer about, because he understood how important it is to have strong Jewish communities here and that how that creates the strength of the alliance moving forward. I know that a lot of Israeli uh, diplomats will go and ask people to make Aliyah. That was sort of the one line that they would say for decades. I personally have never met anyone who made Aliyah because an Israeli official told them to make Aliyah. <laughs> I personally, but I do think it's important to strengthen Jewish identity and I think the challenge has become more acute in recent years. Um, a lot of people think that the relationship between American Jews and, 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 and Israel is, is inexorably drifting apart. I, I totally disagree with that view. Um, what you have is a, a normal situation. We're going to speak about exceptionalism in, this, in, the, in a second, but let's talk a little bit about normalcy. If you're not over the age of 75, you do not remember a world without Israel. And so American Jews have totally forgotten that. They don't appreciate what that world was like if they're younger than 75, and they actually don't appreciate how much Israel made it possible for them to be prouder, not just as Jews, but as Americans, because they were there from, with the choice. And if you speak to people over the age of 75, they'll know exactly what I mean. If you're not over the age of 55, you don't remember vulnerable Israel. You see Israel as a very powerful country, and you add that, those two factors, with intermarriage and assimilation and other things, and you, you could see all these forces that are slowly um, bringing the two uh, uh, countries or communities, Jewish communities, apart. But then you see something that happened like three years ago in 2014 during the war in Gaza, and you see a tremendous rallying around Israel. And all the criticisms and all the arguments that people have, they're all put on the side and there's a rallying around. And that tells me when American Jews feel that there is an acute danger there, they rally to Israel's side. Now, people were suggesting nothing can be done to reverse those trends. We're shocked a few years ago to find a survey that came out um, that showed that the youngest Americans, for those between the ages of about 18 and 29, they're probably now about 18 and 35, were actually more connected to Israel than their predecessors. And it's because of birthright, which was a program that actually this prime minister including some visionaries. I have to give Yossi Balin a credit for that, and also Michael Steinhardt, uh, and since then Lynn Schusterman, and Sheldon Adelson, of course, is the biggest contributor to birthright. But 600,000 young Jews have been brought to Israel. That's a mass, over 600,000 now, a mass of people. And you have Massa programs, and you have other programs that are designed to actually have this quote-unquote Israeli experience, but really to strengthen Jewish identity. I think what Israel needs to do, because of the debt we owe to American Jews in the early years of the state of investing in us, we also have to invest in them to help them build strong and thriving Jewish communities here. And that's just beyond you know, trying to find a solution to the problems of the Kotel or the problems of conversion and other things. It's ensuring that people are strongly connected to their Judaism. Because if you're not connected to the Jewish identity, it's not a surprise that you're not connected to a Jewish state. 
It's obvious. And I think if people think the reason why we have this, you know, what people call this growing disconnect is because of this or that Israeli policy, I think they're kidding themselves. I think the issue is a strong investment in Jewish identity. I think Israel is a place, in a place right now where we can be a partner with American Jews in that effort. I understand that it was only about, I think it was in 2007 or 2008, where Israel for the first time in 19 centuries became the biggest Jewish community in the world. 19th century. When Israel was established in 1948, only 5% of the world's Jews lived in Israel. Before the Holocaust, it was only 2% of the world's uh, Jews. But 5%, 600,000 Jews, my mother was one of them. But over time, because of immigration, because of a very high birth rate, now Israel is the largest Jewish community in the world. And that affects the relationship. You know, when you're a, a son and everyone's revolving around you, that's one thing. Israel always had the advantage of being the homeland, which gave it, I think, a certain place and a certain standing that made it much bigger than its size. But right now, we're the gravitational force. And that means we've got to try to beam as many people in as possible and strengthen those Jewish communities. It's something that I've tried uh, to do as ambassador. It's something that I know um, that with all the difficulties and all the problems, the prime minister uh, deeply believes in as well. Uh, and we'll just have to continue to make that investment. And one thing I would be careful with is taking trends and assuming that they're going to go on a straight line forever. Big changes can happen. I mean, I talked about the early Zionists. One thing all of those people, there were there, a lot of differences of, of opinion between people like Ahad Am and Herzl and others. One thing they all seem to agree on is that Orthodox Judaism, what we call ultra-Orthodox Judaism today, is kaput. I mean, that was finished. That was clear. It was, and it was clear to Ben-Gurion almost a half century later when he made the deal about the army with the Haredi populations. But everybody knew because 90% of them had left. They had left the shtetls. You know, the second they had freedom and the opportunity to integrate into those, into those societies, they did. So everyone thought, well, that's over. Now let's figure out how we can preserve Judaism, which is what Ahad Am wanted. And then Herzl said, well, you know, before we preserve Judaism, we might want to actually have a few Jews around. So uh, he focused on that, but no one really thought that you were going to have the situation you have today. So those people who are predicting the imminent demise of this or that community, they should be careful because these things change. There are historical cycles of them. They've happened in Jewish history before. And if there's a renewal of this sense of Jewish exceptionalism kind of thing that you're doing, then I actually think you could build very strong and thriving Jewish communities right here in America. And it will have a different place than they did 50 years ago, but I think it will be a strong um, an important place in Jewish life. Well, let me just, let me just <clears throat> follow up on this. I presume you're saying, and I, I think I heard you say, obviously a strong, American Jew, a strong American Jewish community is in the interest of Israel. How could it go about helping reestablish that? Because today, the American Jewish community, and no one is, I'm not saying anything about what the trends will be in the next many years. This is just an objective fact today. Um, you know, there was this Pew study, and the Pew study asked, um, let me read the question, did God give the land of Israel to the Jews? 84% of evangelicals said yes. 40% of Jews said yes. Now, 40 isn't zero, but it's a lot less than 84, and it's a lot less than 50. And now, if I, think, it, I, think it may, I think it may have been Elie Wiesel who said that on, the only atheists are Jews. <laughs> because, you know, Jews can love God, they can uh, hate God, they can never ignore God. Only Jews know that God doesn't exist. You see, most non Jews are agnostics, but Jews know that God doesn't exist. <laughs> so, look, I, look I, under, I understand your question, and, and it, certainly the decline, Jewish identity as I tried to make clear in my speech, you can't divorce it from Jewish life and Jewish learning. One of the problems you have, certainly, is the cost of Jewish education. Be an interesting survey, what if somebody actually, what if Jewish education were free? What percent of Jewish families would send their kids to Jewish day schools? I don't know the answer to that question, but it's an interesting question. I mean, it costs a lot of money, but I think one, I don't want to, failure is a harsh word, but I think one thing that 
has not been done because you have many, uh, you know, uh, uh, very wealthy individuals who care about these issues to look at drastically reducing the cost of a Jewish education in America. I know personally many people who simply could not afford to send their, uh, their kids to a Jewish day school. I know people who moved to Israel, frankly, because they had four or five kids and it was important for them to give them a Jewish education, so they moved there because the education was free. Of course, the tax rates are high, but the education is free uh, in Israel. Um, I, I think that it, you have to invest in Jewish education. I think adult Jewish education may be an area that people have not focused on. Most people have a, a lot of Jews have a, a sort of child's understanding of their faith of their values. Um, you know, they stop learning, and it's not their fault, I mean, they stop learning when uh, they're 12, or maybe some of them when they're 16, and they see the Bible as a series of stories. Now, I studied philosophy at Oxford, and I studied Talmud at a yeshiva. Talmud's much harder. It's not even close. And when you study, as probably many people here do, when you study Judaism as an adult, when you read great books, that deal with ideas, that, that start to understand the Bible. And you can read some of the great commentaries on the Bible. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. It's breathtaking. And I, what's sad about the situation is a lot of Jewish adults are not connected to that in any way, and their children won't be connected to that. You have to make the Bible come alive. And you, gotta do it, you have to do it for children. You have to do it for adults. It has to be relevant to people's lives. Uh, I think... You know, if, if you keep all the Jewish laws, it's easy for that to sustain itself. But over time, if you don't keep it alive and keep going, then you'll have a situation, as we've had many times in Jewish history, where all of a sudden when the doors go open, everybody leaves. That's happened time after time in Jewish history. So it's not just a challenge for um, non-Orthodox Jews. It's also a challenge for Orthodox Jews to constantly keep that story alive, keep the story interesting, and let them engage with the Bible and let them engage with Judaism, Jewish ideas, Jewish values as adults. Uh, and I think that that can make a profound difference. Who are the people that can lead that? I don't know. But there are, you know, have a, now with the, uh, the ability that you have with uh, media, with social media. And one thing I don't understand is why the, the whole educational model has not completely collapsed. Because we're teaching the way that we taught two or three hundred years ago in the same way. But now you have, with the technology that you have, I mean, you could have a lecture from Jonathan Sachs one day, something from, you know, Rav Steinzoltz another day, take three or four uh, great rabbis, great scholars of Judaism, uh, and you could have a, an adult educational program. And if you figured out how to get it to people, um, I think it could do remarkable things. I know that there are certain efforts like that that are going on, but I think if people put serious money and effort into this, it could help begin to change things because Judaism is very exciting. It's got a lot to offer. It's fascinating. Like I said, when you delve in deeply into Jewish ideas, it's hard to get out of there. Um, but many people don't even have the keys to open the door. So where did yours come from? It came because, you know, I went to uh, the Wharton School of Business uh, as an undergrad. The reason why I went to Wharton School of Business is I read a book when I was 15 years old called The Art of the Deal. <laughs> That's not, by the way, that's not a joke. That's a true story. <laughs> I read a book. It, I was 15 years old, 16 years old. I was interested in entrepreneurship. And then in the mid eight, late to late 80s. What this a is, deprived childhood you had. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and Donald Trump made it sound so exciting. He talked about the school I'd never heard of called the Wharton School of Business, which he said was the best business school. <laughs> And I, of course, wanted to go to the best, and so that's why I ended up, you know, I ended up going there. But, you know, when I went to, when I went to Warden and I, I majored in, uh, in finance and management, and, um, you know, half of our class were in the liberal arts schools. But when I graduated, I felt that I hadn't done, read everything that I wanted to read. And so then I did a second degree at Oxford in philosophy, politics, and economics. And when I started reading the ideas of all these great thinkers, I, I said to myself, wait a second. What about the ideas of our great thinkers? I mean, I mentioned the Talmud before. The Talmud is a book where the greatest minds of the Jewish people were engaged in that book for over three centuries. What if I told you that there was a book of any people and their best and brightest would sit 
and work on that book for over three centuries, maybe longer. Do you think that would be worth reading, looking into? And as an adult, I went to a yeshiva, and I was very interested in Jewish learning, started reading everything that I could about our Where? history in, and tradition. In, in, I went, when I went to Israel, yeah. I would go, I would work for Sharansky uh, in the evening, and then in the morning I would actually study Talmud in, in, in a yeshiva. But it's a culture of Jewish learning. It's, you know, I'm probably many people here do it, but on Saturday, you know, when you go to shul, uh, you know, you got something in the talus bag that you put in, and you printed out your essays, and it's ideas, and you constantly want to be exposed to them, constantly want to challenge yourself, uh, and it's an endless fascination. I mean, every time I sit in shul and I read the Parshat Shavua, every year, something else clicks, and I'm sure it does for everybody, but you got to be engaged with that, and you have to see this remarkable treasure that we have and to understand its value. And you've got to show that it's valuable to you in order to pass it on to your children. And I think one of the problems you have is you have, I mean, certainly American Jews, it's a big problem. They don't speak Hebrew. And so they get intimidated by that encounter. One of the things that I discussed with someone many years ago is what about the possibility of ensuring that Hebrew was in every uh, public school area where you would have large Jewish communities? as a language that people could um, learn. Because what I found, I went to a, a, a fraternity, I was in a fraternity at the University of Pennsylvania. There were 90 brothers in the fraternity. 86 were Jews. One was Orthodox, me. So I know a lot, my, you know, even though I went to a Jewish day school in Miami Beach, I went to the Hebrew Academy, but all my friends were non-Orthodox and I could see from them how difficult it was. They wanted to go to the synagogue with me. They wanted, but they were lost. And so you've got to give people the tools which of, where they can even do that engagement. And at some point, it might be 30, maybe it's 40, maybe it's 50, people just give up and say it's too late. First of all, I, it's never too late. Rabbi Akiva started at 40. And he became the greatest scholar of his age at 40. So if you start at 60 and you become the top 10, not so bad. <laughs> So, I agree with your admonition, admonition about that Jewish conservatism shouldn't identify itself and look for Judaism to be the markings of a new political thought effort or the Republican Party or any, anything to do with that. But what are those Jewish values that really should inform the way America lives today? Not just for Jews, but just what do, what do we have to offer that we haven't done a very good job, meaning American Jewry, of communing that, communicating that to the largest part of our population, which is in essence, in some form or another, a political act. So what? It's, it connects also to the last question that you asked me. So a few years ago, I was reading a book of quotes, and this might, might have been the eureka moment for me. Um, of why I realized that I had to learn much more. Um, a book of quotes, and I saw a quote, who is the rich man? The one who was happy with what he has. And my mother, I have a Sabra mother, interesting that she was born and raised in Israel in Gadara, in Gadara and she went to a secular school in Gadara in Israel, and this would be in the early 40s. She knows Tanakh much better than I do having gone to a Jewish day school in America. That is no longer the case in Israel. If you go to a secular school in Israel, you would have virtually no knowledge of Tanakh. But my mother re has deep knowledge of Tanakh. And this is not in Tanakh, it's in Pirkei Avot. But you know, when I was growing up, she constantly, every time something would happen, like I was like, it was drilled into me. So I got, have this book of quotes, and I see who is the rich man, the one who's happy with what he has. And then I see who said it, Ben Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> People don't know. And they read all these scholars, and they don't realize that it comes from their own sources. Now, I don't, I don't have a problem with people running around to find truth in India, but how about finding, looking at the truth that your own people have to offer before you run out to the ashram? because we're a 4,000-year-old culture. So you asked me 
uh, the question about what are those values. Look, right now, you know, young people today, the buzzword, most, most important issue, social justice. Is there, is there a more important and fundamental concept of social justice than the idea that everyone is created in the image of God? That is actually the beginning of social justice because if you truly believe that, you will treat people differently. If you live your life based on that belief that every human being is created in the image of God, you will treat them with a level of respect. Now, in a society that doesn't respect God, I don't believe over time that's the case. I do think people themselves and maybe their families, they can pass on those values. But over time, and history suggests this is true, you will not be able to sustain values over time if it's not rooted, this is my view, I hope it's a learned view, in a belief in God um, and in those values. There are other values as well, the values of the family, the values of personal responsibility, um, of accountability. Um, the list goes on, you know, on and on. But if you take any issue, what I would hope is that people will first try to understand what their own faith and tradition says about those values. I mean, I have to tell you, the thing I am most contemptuous about is Israel's ambassador is when I start getting moral lectures from other nations and other <laughs> representatives. I mean, I do. Uh, you know, you, you see like the United Nations is, is giving lectures to Israel about peace when we put the quote on the wall of the United <laughs> Nations. That's from Isaiah. So they're going to give us lectures about values? Whether it's peace, whether it's about injustice, whether it's about helping, as I said, the poor, widows, orphans, everything. We actually gave the world this moral code. And it was passed on through other faiths to people around the world. But we actually, this was our moral code. This is the foundation of the morals that are associated with Western civilization. It's definitely not the same thing as Western civilization. But the morals at the heart of the Western civilization come from Judaism. Western civilization is a marriage between Athens and Jerusalem. So we should be very proud of that legacy. And when we talk about political issues and values, on any subject, we should look, hey, what do we have to say about those ideas? What does our faith tell us? The danger becomes, as I said earlier, when you believe that the faith and the political program are the same, and when you do cherry picking because it's a very shallow view of that. I mean, if I have some great Talmudists, and after studying everything, they say this is the political <laughs> platform. You know, I, I respect that and I listen to it and I want to understand that because they've actually thought about those issues deeply. They read deeply. But just to simply go on the surface and take this and take this and take this and bake some sort of cake, I think actually undermines Judaism and p makes people not take Judaism seriously. And it's a very serious faith with very serious ideas that have serious relevance to everyday life. Just following up on what you said a moment ago, what's happening to the Israeli educational system? If, if a young, young man or a young woman really, unless they're going to, a, to a, a day school or a Jewish school of some sort, they no longer really learn about Tanakh and they won't come out of that, what's the implications of that going forward for that shared destiny? And if that destiny in Israel is Judaism and its exceptional quality. What does that say? No, I, I, I think it's a, it's a problem and it's an, it's an issue. Uh, uh, if I look at the maybe the two most serious issues to me in Israeli society, within Israeli society, it's not that you know, democracy is collapsing and all of these ridiculous ideas. I think integrating the ultra-Orthodox into the uh, workforce and the population in Israel, I see it almost as a, as a huge benefit because as I, when you can sit down and study Talmud 12 hours a day, you'll be pretty good at a lot of other jobs. <laughs> and if we can make that, that transition and we do it in a smart way that don't, doesn't make them feel threatened but makes, that pulls them in, I actually think that it can dramatically upgrade Israel's economy. You know, we were blessed with the immigrants from the former Soviet Union. We have almost an internal immigration. And one of Israel's economic problems is that we have a very li uh, low labor force participation rate in Israel relative to most OECD countries. And it's largely two groups, 
Arab women and ultra-Orthodox men. Um, and both of them are different reasons why. But if the ultra-Orthodox population join the workforce and they start making eight of those hours a day working, I think it will dramatically upgrade um, Israel's economy. But the other issue is, is the educational system in, is, in Israel. It's not something I'm expert in because uh, my wife is here. We have five children, so we're doing our part for the demographic battle. <laughs> but we came, when we came here four years ago, our eldest then was 10. Um, and our youngest was only a few months. So, but it's a concern that we have when we go back. Will they be able to get a very strong both Jewish and secular education? And in Israel, there are essentially four streams of education. The, there is the secular system, which I think has been what, I, 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 uh, what I've heard. I should say I haven't studied the issue myself. But really, all the, almost all the Jewish content has been taken out of the secular education. Then there's the ultra-Orthodox system, which has an issue with the secular education and making sure that there's essential core curriculum that you have to have, which is something that I think needs to be pushed very strongly. And if people don't want funding, it's another story. But if you want funding, a lot of times funding comes with strings attached, because that's going to prepare them for the 21st century. Then you have the Arab education system, and then you have what's called the Stati Lumi, which is sort of like a national religious, but it's not, more, not national, it's both Jewish and secular education. And I think it really depends where you are. There's some great schools in Jerusalem, there's some great schools in other cities, there are other areas where the schools are not as good. But we're going to have to do a serious, Israel's leaders are going to have to ensure that we have a generation of Jews that are knowledgeable of their own faith and traditions. And my, my mother is 81. She sounds very young to me. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the same thing with people who are 60 and certainly not people who are 40. <laughs> uh, the demographics are making the ultra-Orthodox, the national religious, and even the traditional population actually grow more. Um, but you have to make it important. I, you know what struck me uh, about speeches? So sometimes I would work with the Prime Minister on, and he, he writes speeches as well. He's a, he's a writer. Um, but in comparing speeches that you give in English and speeches that you give in Hebrew, the speeches in English are much more inspiring. And the speeches in Hebrew at the Knesset are very sort of tachlis. <laughs> and one thing that struck me when I came to Israel is how few people actually quote the Bible in Israel. It is completely normal for a secular American politician, a president, as part of the discourse, to quote passages from the Bible. It is not in Israel. The prime minister actually is somewhat different in that as he, us he usually does, or he tries to, more than other Israeli political leaders have the past. I think that we need to get much more comfortable in Israel with our traditions. And part of the discomfort, I think, has to do with the politicization of religion because you have religious parties in Israel. So a lot of people sort of back away from that. They don't want to have anything to do with it because if that's what it is, I don't want that. Um, and it's something, it's a challenge that I think um, serious Israeli secular, traditional, and religious can actually work to advance in a, pretty substantial, in a pretty substantial way. I don't think it's been given the priority uh, that it should be. <clears throat> okay, we don't have that much time, but so let me just, I'd like to follow up on, you know, the insight you, know, you, st you st started before about, you know, President Truman, but other presidents as well, whether it was Eisenhower or whether it was Lyndon Johnson. And those presidents in some, in some way or another had American interests first, which not America first, American interests first. I think all presidents have American that's, interests well, first. Well, yeah. and I think we're sort of coming, I think we're at one of those situations right now. And whether you'll be able to comment on it fully, I don't expect it. But, but let me just, let me throw it out because we're approaching a situation right now where the irony is the ironic twist for Israel is that the United States' effort to really set back, destroy ISIS in Syria has been enormously successful. 
And one of the things we're doing is pulling our troops out. And we're in effect providing, and we're pulling our troops out because we think we've done our job, we've completed it, there's no reason to have any more troops in Syria. And the real beneficiary of this is Iran. Iran now has a land bridge that in essence runs from Iraq through Syria to Lebanon to the very border of Israel. And I'm not sure you'd recommend or I'd be interested what you would recommend to our president, but I'm more interested in thinking about how you see it. How's Israel going to handle this? This is now a large number of potential adversaries on that border, leave aside Russia. And what do you see America doing, which is what it is doing right now is pulling back, or at least appears to be pulling back. And where does that leave you guys? Well, I actually don't think that America is pulling back. Um, look, America, the issue of Syria is Iran. That's, that's the problem. The issue of Lebanon is Iran. The issue of Iraq is Iran. The issue of Yemen is Iran. Um, they're the main force for instability in the region. Uh, and what happened, the new administration came in. They conducted a review of their policies towards Iran. And the president gave a speech about, I think it's about five or six weeks ago at this point, where he announced a new policy in Iran. So America is not a speedboat. They don't make decisions from day to day. They... It's an aircraft carrier. It takes a long time to turn. Uh, and the president gave this speech, which I could have signed off on every word of that speech. Uh, and it represented a dramatic shift in U.S. policy that I don't think people fully appreciate it because the ship is still being turned around. Uh, the president changed the policy of containment of a nuclear Iran because that's what the JCPOA it doesn't prevent a nuclear Iran. It contains it because it gives them a path to the bomb, to many bombs actually, in a few years when all these restrictions will be automatically removed. They don't need to sneak in or break into the nuclear club. If they wait long enough, they'll just walk into the nuclear club. So the president actually shifted U.S. policy from containment to prevention, and he shifted U.S. policy from accommodating Iran's aggression to a policy at a rhetorical level, at least, of pushing back and rolling back Iran's aggression. Now, a lot of people say, well, what do you have on the ground? That's true. You get to that. America, when it moves, it eventually gets a lot of things on the ground. But first, it actually all starts with a policy. And conceptually, right now, Israel and the United States are lined up on the most important strategic issues facing a country in a way we have not been in years and maybe decades. And I said that months ago, and I will definitely say it today. Now the question is, for us, we are working together with the U.S. administration of translating those principles into actually po actual policies on the ground. And one of the theaters where they come into play is in Syria. Now, the senior administration officials know that if they pull back from Syria that Iran walks in. And I don't think they want to see that happen. Now, the President of the United States, as he's you know, said many times, he's not looking to put boots on the ground in all these places, but he understands and I think and appreciates that if you have a precipitous move away, it's not that you're ceding it simply to Russia, you're ceding it to Iran because Iran has the ground forces there. It's Iranian Shia militias. It's Iranian Hezbollah. Russia has the air force. Russia has the diplomatic backing, but the boots on the ground are Iranian boots on the ground. And if the United States pulls out precipitously, then actually you'd be right. They would be ceding that territory and giving the spoils of their victory over ISIS to Iran. But I don't see there's any desire on the part of the U.S. administration to do it. And um, you saw when it came to Afghanistan that there was a feeling that people had that the president was going to pull out. And a lot of senior people within the administration didn't want that to happen. They were afraid that if they pulled out of, Syria, of Afghanistan, what would happen there is what happened in Iraq in 2011 when Obama pulled out and then all of a sudden ISIS emerged. So eventually the president was convinced that he needed to stay in Afghanistan, continue with the strategy because the costs of leaving were too great. Now, 
the investment of the U.S. in, the, in Afghanistan is significantly greater than its investment in Syria or the potential investment they'd have to have. And the stakes, frankly, are smaller. I'm not saying they're not important there, but they're smaller. So I think as this ship is turning around, I think that you're going to see a more robust policy than people think. And they're not going to cede a Syria to the Iranians. I can tell you from Israel's point of view, we've been very clear, the Prime Minister has been very clear about what our red lines are. Um, we're not going to enable Iran to establish a military presence, military bases, permanent military bases in Syria. And we will continue to take action in order to prevent that. And we are also very pleased with a decision regarding the JCPOA, which actually was a, a, a very courageous decision. It was against the view of every European country. It was against the view of many senior people in his own administration. The only ones who supported the president's decision were Israel and the Arab states. And that actually should count for something, I have to tell you. Uh, one of the things about the <coughs> Iran debate that I found most disturbing I tend to focus sometimes on these moral issues, these values issues. Well, one thing that I found most disturbing is that when it came to the nuclear deal with North Korea, and everyone knows how that turned out, but what was interesting is that they had six party talks. Two of the parties at those talks were the Japanese and the South Koreans. They were there around the table. It's pretty hard to come to President Bush or President Clinton before, and both of them did deals with the North Koreans, and blame them for doing what their allies on the front lines were pleading with them to do. There's moral weight to that decision. The ones who have the most to lose are telling you to do this deal. In the case of the P5 plus 1 talks, Israel was not there. The Arab states were not there. And they said once, if you're not sitting around the table, you're usually on the menu. <laughs> and if it wasn't so serious, it would be very fun. <coughs> but we are the guinea pigs of this experiment, which has been an unmitigated disaster. And everything that you hear about people, people saying, well, Iran is not violating the deal, we are on cruise control heading over a cliff when it comes to the nuclear deal. And when people say they're not violating the deal, it's saying the cruise control is working. Thankfully, the Prime Minister of Israel is focused on the cliff. And where I give credit, a lot of credit to President Trump, is that he could have said, we won't go over the cliff during my presidency, whether it's one term or two term. It'll be after, it'll be year 12, year 13, somebody else's problem. And he didn't. He's trying to deal with this problem now. And I have great respect for that decision, because every year that goes by, it makes it harder and harder. When the agreement was signed, the interim agreement, Iran, the sanctions were costing Iran $100 billion every 18 months. When the deal was signed, there was an argument in the press, is it $50 billion or $100 billion or 100? That's the signing bonus of the deal. The real money is every 18 months, when $100 billion flows into Iran's co coffers as they produce more oil and get more investment. And those hundreds of billions of dollars, probably a trillion over a 15-year period, that money's not going to go for a GI Bill for returning members of the Revolutionary Guard. It's going to go to fund the Shia militias in Iraq, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and to establish those permanent bases. And look, we're, you're at a conference where you're talking about ideas and great challenges facing the Jewish people. We throw around the word existential challenge all the time on all sorts of things. Israel faces only one existential challenge. And that's a nuclear-armed Iran. It's not even Iran. It's a nuclear-armed Iran. And we have to do everything we can to prevent that from happening, which is why when the president gave that speech, I was two hours later in the White House, and I said to the National Security Advisor, this is the second best day I've had as ambassador of Israel. So, of course, he asked me, what was the best day? <laughs> and I said, the best day was when my prime minister made his speech in Congress. Because I cannot ask others what we're not willing to do ourselves.
Ladies and gentlemen, let us thank Ambassador German. Thank you.